Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. True Tales of Haunted Houses, Volume 2, Story Number 1. Grand Lake is way up on the northern boundary of the state of Maine. When this story took place, that area was pure wilderness, almost off the beaten track of civilization. It was beloved then, as it is today, by big city sportsmen. It was a group of such sportsmen, well-to-do city men, who decided to build a clubhouse up on the most uninhabited shore of Grand Lake. Later, when they first heard the stories that their beautiful clubhouse was haunted, they ridiculed such reports, but the ridicule changed to concern when they found that no matter what salary they offered, what lures they put forth, no man would take on the job of caretaker at the clubhouse on Coffin Point. The clubhouse was situated on a curve of land, almost a miniature bay, and the land jutted out into a point at one side of the clubhouse. This spot became known as Coffin Point because there could be found the decayed remains were eaten and crumpling to dust of a rude coffin. A hunter coming upon this grizzly find would always want to know the history of the coffin, but would find that about all he could learn from his guide was that he was on Coffin Point. If the hunter or fisherman walked but a short distance from the point, he would come upon a large two-story structure that had a broad veranda running around the front of the house. It was a very comfortable looking house, and if it were summer or during the height of hunting season, the house would be well occupied by a group of big city prosperous sportsmen. This was their private clubhouse. If, however, a visit were made, between the seasons the place had a lonely, deserted look. A visitor investigating might find that thousands of dollars worth of supplies could be seen in the house, and there was no mistaking the house was very well furnished. But where was the caretaker? He would soon find out it was no question to ask. Any guide, trapper, hunter, or woodsman of that section would blanch at the question especially if it were asked as dusk were coming on. Instead of an answer, the stranger would be told it would be wise to keep moving. The people who lived in the area of Grand Lake neither discussed Coffin Point nor the clubhouse, nor could they be lured near the place after dark. It was only through an accident that the story came to light half a century ago. A Harold Marsh of Bangor, a fearless young man of about 20 years old became lost in that vicinity while on a fishing trip. Had it not been for that chance mishap, the story of Coffin Point would have remained locked in the hearts of the hunters and guides of that northern section. The clubhouse, a fine building with a beautiful location, was built probably in the late 1870s by a group of big city sportsmen who wanted all the comforts of home when they went into the north woods hunting and fishing. The men hired to construct the clubhouse were brought in from all parts of the country for the work. From the outset, everything progressed smoothly, and not until the house was almost completed did anything occur to mar the record. The fishing in the lake was excellent as the workmen soon found out. Every night and morning, before and after work, the men would be out on the lake with rod and reel. They had good sport and trout, and landlocked salmon formed a major part of their daily menu. Among the men who were on the construction job was a native of Prince Edward's Island, a P.I., as they were commonly called in eastern and northern Maine. This man was a dedicated fisherman. He would rather fish than eat, and every spare minute of his time, when not engaged in labor, was spent on the lake, and no two men in the crew brought in more fish than did P.I. It was his love of fishing that proved his undoing and threw a spell over the clubhouse which was to stay down the years. One night, so the story goes, when the crew came in from a hard day's work, P.I., as he was known to his fellow workers, had straight for the lake and fishing. That particular night, the camp cook was anxious to have supper over early 
and he was fearful that if anyone went out on the lake, supper would be delayed. When he saw P.I. about to push his canoe from shore, the cook called to him, P.I., you'd better wait until after supper. No, I'm all right, P.I. shouted back. You won't be back in time for supper, persisted the cook. To this, P.I. made a mocking reply that was to become famous. I'll be back in time for supper or I'll eat it in hell. With that, P.I. gave the canoe a vigorous shove with his paddle and headed down the lake, soon disappearing from sight of people on the shore. As he went around the point, the men who had overheard the remark laughed and told the cook that P.I. would rather catch a trout than eat a square meal and forgot all about the incident. But P.I. really was late for supper. He didn't come back, and he didn't come back, and finally, the cook gave up waiting for him and the rest of the crew ate. Not until bedtime, near did they begin to wonder about P.I. He always had returned earlier from previous trips. The speculation increased, and the men became concerned, then openly worried. Nobody thought of going to bed. And then somebody recalled that last remark that he'd either be back in time for supper or would eat it in hell. The natural superstition of the men began to assert itself. There was no sleep in camp that night. A big bonfire was kindled on the shore that kept burning brightly all night. It was hoped it would prove a beacon to guide the lost one back to camp. Huddled around the campfire, the men watched and waited and prayed for P.I. Occasionally a member of the frightened crew would recall a case of the strange disappearance of hunter, fisher, or trapper, and at each story the men drew closer together and nearer to the fire, their fright growing more and more pronounced. It was a long, weary vigil. The blackness of the night held them awe-stricken and afraid. They dare not start a search, but with the rising of the sun they took active measures to find their lost companion. Work was forgotten as the men manned canoes and started scouring the shores while others beat along the shore in the woods. It was a fruitless search. Night found the camp shrouded in gloom and fear, for no trace of the missing P.I., not even his canoe, had been found. It was agreed that in some way P.I. had been drowned and the canoe had sunk. Preparations were made for grappling for the body. In anticipation of recovering the body, a rude coffin was made and taken to the point on the shore. Then began the work of dragging the lake bottom for the body of the missing man. For days, the men worked hard, but finally the search was abandoned. The men decided that by some strange hocus-pocus beyond their comprehension, the devil had accepted the challenge of P.I.'s last words. No one thought of removing the coffin from the point, and thus the point was to be known forever as Coffin Point. In due time, the clubhouse was completed. The workmen left, and the club members arrived. That first season was most enjoyable. The members voted that no mistake had been made in building there, on the beautiful lake, deep in Maine's great woods. When they were told the sad accident to P.I., the men were most sympathetic, and they too speculated as to what had become of the canoe. There had been no storm that night. He disappeared. It was an accepted fact that P.I. had drowned. But when the guys suggested that the devil had taken the canoe, the club members laughed. They were not superstitious, and while they could offer no satisfactory explanation of why the canoe never had been found, they insisted that evidently in some strange way the canoe had filled and sunk. Strangely enough, the club members never suggested moving the crude coffin that had been built for P.I. They all saw it out on the point, stopped by it, and grew silent but not one ever mentioned that it should be moved. Then winter started, closing in, and the clubhouse was prepared for the winter months. The club members voted that a caretaker was needed, offered a good salary for those days, plus a most comfortable winter home, and no trouble in securing a trusted, capable man to look after the clubhouse. Yet the men had barely returned to their homes when they received notification that the caretaker had thrown up his job and had left Grand Lake. More than that, there was additional information that there was not enough money on earth to lure him back to the clubhouse. Why? asked the mystified club members. Because he says it's haunted. 
came the reply. The club members decided that the man had grown lonesome, but when they questioned him, he told a strange story of what had taken place after he was left alone. Not one club member paid the least bit of attention to the story. They were certain he had invented it as a means of getting out of the job. Another caretaker was quickly hired and sent up to the clubhouse, but he only stayed a few days. There was no doubting his fright. He insisted a ghost haunted the clubhouse, but that was all he had to say. Undaunted, the officers of the club found another man for the job, and he was sent up. His tenure was brief. By that time, word was getting around, so the club members decided the house would be safe enough, left without a caretaker until a sensible man could be found. Bill Hammond appeared on the scene. Hammond was told about the job that was available, and he said he wasn't afraid of any or all ghosts. If the money was good, he would take the job. He applied, and the club officials were delighted at the prospect of a caretaker who had no fear of the supernatural. When Hammond went on the job as caretaker at the clubhouse. Young Marsh, the banger youth, was up in the section on a fishing trip. Young Marsh had never even heard of the exclusive clubhouse, less about ghosts, nor had he ever heard of Bill Hammond. Marsh was having great luck on his trip, and one day struck such good fortune that he failed to realize how late the hour was growing. When he did start back to his campsite, he knew he had stayed in the lake too long, and before he neared his location, darkness fell. Marsh was accustomed to the woods, but in the complete darkness, he found that somehow he had lost his bearings. He did not panic. Instead, he took his bearings as best he could and started tramping through the woods, certain that sooner or later he would pick up a familiar landmark. Toward midnight, he came upon a clearing, and in the center was a big building. It was the clubhouse on Grand Lake. A light shone in one of the upper windows, so Marsh made his way to the steps went up the steps to the front door and rapped. Who's there? called a voice from the house. A man who has lost his way, replied Marsh. All right, said the voice inside. Just a minute and I'll let you in. There were sounds of footsteps coming down the stairs. The bolt of the door slid back and the door opened. In the door stood Hammond, his hair standing up, his eyes staring, a rifle grasped in his hand. His face was white. What's the matter? asked Marsh. I've had a mix-up with a spook. What? Yes, sirree, with a spook. A real sure enough ghost, Hammond said. I'm going to get out of here now. Young Marsh got Hammond to let him into the place and eventually got him to tell a story. Hammond at first outlined the history of the place and then said, When I came up here, I didn't believe in ghosts and figured that the stories of the place being haunted were just a result of a very vivid imagination, or else a very strong disinclination to remain up here in the woods. The pay looked good to me, so I took the job. The first and second nights nothing happened, but it came tonight. Hammond stopped, here for an apprehensive look about the place, and then continued. I'd been asleep. I don't know how long. When I was waked up by a tapping noise, at first I couldn't locate it, but after a while I did. It was out on the veranda roof, near that window. I went over to the window and looked out. I tell you, friend, that what I saw made my hair rise. It did that. There was a great black body with a head, which I couldn't make out, dancing around on the veranda roof. I watched it and watched it. I dare not leave the window. Blimey, it jumped off the roof to the ground, and I left the window. I was afraid. Friend, badly afraid. I got the gun and went to the head of the stairs there, for fear it would come into the house and try to come up the stairs. I stood there at the head of the stairs and watched and listened. All at once I heard the bolt on the inside of the door slide back, and then the door opened and the thing came in. It danced and pranced around the room. I was paralyzed with fear. All at once it made a jump and came right up to the head of the stairs and right back to the floor down there. Friend, it never touched a stair. 
It did that three or four times. I couldn't shoot. Something seemed to freeze my hand right onto the gun and stopped me shooting. Then it went out the door, shut it, and when it was shut, the bolt slid back into place. I went back to the window and saw it disappear in a great jump into the air. I sat on the bed with a rifle in my hand, trying to spunk up courage enough to strike out for civilization. That's what I was going when you came. I'm going to get now. No more caretaker in a haunted house for me. By the time Hammond finished his story, it was near morning. Marsh was willing to leave, so they struck out. Afterwards, Marsh inquired and found that Hammond's story was different from the stories told by previous caretakers on their experience in their house. There were several versions of the ghost. Marsh learned, but he also learned that everyone in that area was convinced that the clubhouse was haunted. And that is the story of Coffin Point, the haunted clubhouse, and the man who never returned for supper. And it has been told through the years around many a campfire when the shadows are growing long and the loons across the lake are laughing. Next story. Charles M. Skinner, who visited the Maine woods in the 1890s, collected many stories of unusual creatures of folklore, such as the Willem Alone, the Side Hill Winder, and the Dingball. He feared that some of the creatures which infest the woods of the lumbering counties of Aroostock, Piscatiquis, and Penobscot have had their unusual qualities magnified in local myths for the silency of fretful children and the stimulation of generosity on the part of greenwood choppers. It is a newcomer in a lumber camp who is subjected to the usual amount of hazing, just as he might be as a freshman in college, and he is expected to do a little more than his share of the breakfast getting, errand running, and the like, in order to quiet the hostility of the Will Amalones. Today, it is said these creatures are not seen as often as they were, for they have a fixed hostility to mankind and educational institutions, never venturing within ten miles of a school. The Will Amalone is a quick little animal, resembling a squirrel that rolls poisonous lichens in its fingers and drops them into the ears and on the eyelids of sleeping men in camp, causing them to have strange dreams, rashes, and headaches, and to see unusual, unbelievable objects in the snow. Quite often the hardest drinkers in the camp are said to be most easily and most often affected by the poison. The side hill winder is a rabbit-like creature, so-called because he winds about steep hills in only one direction. Because of this, in order that his back may be kept level, the downhill legs are longer than the uphill pair. He is seldom caught, but this can be done by heading him off with dogs when he is corkscrewing up a mountain. As the dogs slowly turn the winder, his long legs come on the uphill side and tip him over. He is then an easy prey to the canine creatures chasing him. Much to be dreaded is the dingball, a panther whose last tail joint is not only bare of flesh, but ball-shaped, resembling a four-pound shot. With this weapon, it cracks its victim's skull, and there is no record of a survival from the blow of a dingball. In more ancient times, it is said to have sung with a human voice, and in this way leered unsuspecting humans from their cabins to have their heads broken in the dark. The dingball is fond of mankind and will sing all night for a meal of white human flesh. Stay away from razor shins. A deathless red man who works for such as are kind to him but mutilates those who neglect to pay tribute in alcohol. The trick is to keep razor shins supplied with fire water a jug at every full moon, and he will very often fell a tree for you with his sharp shin bones, or, if nobody's around, will clear up a bit of road. But if you begin to omit his monthly stimulation, you must be prepared for the possibility of losing your scalp, which this Indian can slice from your head with a single kick. He is also proficient in clipping ears, and is capable of leaving cuts that will look like saber strokes. When a green hand arrives in a lumber camp, it is his duty to slake the thirst of razor shins. 
he puts a jug of virulent banger whiskey at the door. The best proof that he exists is the unusual odor which pervades the premises all night and the empty jug which is discovered in the morning. At the turn of the present century, when French-Canadian lubbermen were chopping down the trees, the men would quit work if a white owl flew from any tree they were felling. Not one of them would look back or shout at it, for it was a ghost, and would cause them much trouble unless they left that part of the wood for thirty days. The Windigo, a being in human form, is said to be the worst woods creature of all, but is seen only in the sparsely populated areas of Maine and the thickest wooded districts. A Canadian Indian is the only man who ever saw one and lived, but why no one knows. Merely to look upon the Windigo is doom, and even to cross his track is deadly peril. His footprints are 24 inches long, and in the middle of each imprint is a red spot, showing where his blood has oozed through a hole in his moccasin. Dark, huge, and shadowy as he seems, the Windigo still has a human shape and many human characteristics. Strangely enough, the belief in this monster is still said to be so genuine that lumbermen on occasional secure monopoly of certain jobs by scaring competitors out of the neighborhood. Those in the know say that the simple device of tramping past rival camps and for covered snowshoes and squeezing a drop of beef blood or paint into each footprint usually is enough. One particularly effective episode caused the flight of Indian choppers from a lumber district, and no one could persuade them to return to work, for the Winnegago's tracks had been seen. It was claimed that this particular Windigo was an Irishman who was not a bad fellow at all, but the Indians would not be convinced and kept away for the rest of the season. Indeed, it is said that the stealthy stride of the Windigo monster makes every lumberman's blood run cold, and his mere mention is to be avoided. A devil named Pumula lives on the slopes of Mount Katnan in Maine. This devil, a being that has the shape of a panther, but is larger and wears four tusks that hangs out of its mouth for 14 inches will gladly eat animals and Indians. But on the other hand, is so terrified by white men that no scientist has been able to see him even with strong binoculars. Bullets are powerless against him, while knives mean nothing. He is vulnerable only to a stroke of lightning which can kill him. Before the first white man came to the main forest, Pomula made a yearly levy on the Indians, selecting half a dozen annually. But since the advent of Europeans, the male Indians have become so flavored with rum that Pomula can stomach only the maidens. In the year 1823, Pomula killed four members of a large hunting party on Joe Mary Lake, three more the next day at South Turn Lake, and was on the verge of overtaking the survivors at Millinocket Rips near Elbow Lake when a thunderstorm hit the area. Pomula, so the legend goes, was struck and killed by lightning during the storm. The Indians say that when found he was measured and his length was twice as long as a four-man canoe. The body was floated to Old Town on two boats, and the people of that Indian reservation capital celebrated the death of Pomula with candles and fire water. One of the tusks, blackened by the lightning, is treasured in the family of the descendants of old chief Sakalexis. Geologists have seen it and say it came out of the head of the saber-toothed tiger that lived in the Maine woods several million years ago. As writer Charles M. Skinner said in 1903, scientists did not live in Maine in 1823, so how could they possibly know that the tiger did not hold over until that date? Next story. Peter Rugg originally was mentioned by William Austin in a letter supposedly written by Jonathan Dunwell of New York to Herman Croft. In the summer of 1820, Jonathan Dunwell of New York was on a stagecoach going from Providence to Boston, riding up front with a driver. Reaching Attleboro, Massachusetts, Dunwell noticed that the horses suddenly threw their ears back on their necks as flat as a hare's. The driver explained that a storm breeder was coming. Soon afterward, 
a small speck was sighted far ahead on the road which is now known as Route 1. A few minutes later, an open makeshift chase drawn by a large black horse came rolling towards them at about 12 miles an hour. The driver, a small child at his side, was grasping the reins with firmness. His appearance was one of dejection, and he glanced anxiously at the stage passengers and driver as he went by. Horse and chase were soon out of sight, vanishing in the direction of Providence. A moment later, Dunwell noticed that the horse's ears were back in place and all seemed normal again. He asked the driver about the man, and the driver explained that although no one really knew him or the small girl at his side, he had met the chase more than a hundred times. The stage driver said that the occupant of the chase had often asked him the way to Boston, even when the carriage was heading for Providence and away from Boston. Lately, however, the man had refused to talk with him. The driver was sure of one thing, that a rainstorm always followed an encounter with a chase. Sometime later, the coach ascended a high hill in Walpole, and Dunwell began to think that as there was not a cloud, big as a marble in sight, the driver was wrong, and he told him so. So look in the direction whence the man's came, answered the driver. The storm never meets him, it follows him. On the crest of the next hill, the driver pointed out a speck of cloud the size of a hat, and then expressed a fear that their stop at Polly's Tavern could not be made before the storm hit. The wanderer and his child will go to Providence through rain, thunder, and lightning, concluded the driver. Instinctively, the horses began to speed up. The little black cloud came rolling down the turnpike toward them, spreading out in all directions as it approached. Successive flashes of chain lightning caused the cloud to display a thousand fantastic images. The driver confided that every flash of lightning near its center discovered to him distinctly the form of a man sitting in an open carriage drawn by a black horse. Try as he could, however, Dunwell saw no such image in the darkened sky. Reaching Polly's tavern, the passengers scrambled inside just as the heavens opened up but as soon as all were inside, the torrential rain was over, almost as quickly as it had started. A moment later, a gentleman drove up and told the others that he had been stopped by the same chase. The driver had asked the gentleman for the way to Boston, after which he had driven off in the opposite direction. Looking back, the gentleman had watched as a thunderclap broke directly over the chase, enveloping man, child, horse, and carriage. I stopped, said the gentleman, supposing the lightning had struck him, but the horse seemed to loom up and increase his speed. A few minutes afterward, a peddler with a cart stopped at the inn, everything dripping from the storm. He explained that he had met the chase in four different states within a fortnight and was getting fed up with the encounters. Each time the man had asked the way to Boston, and each time shortly after, the man had driven away. The peddler had been caught in a cloudburst. The peddler ended by saying that he was going to take out marine insurance for the future. In short, stated the peddler, I wish never to see that man and horse again. They do not look to me as though they belong to this world. The coach passenger soon climbed aboard and traveled the remainder of the journey from Providence to Boston without further incident. Three years later, Dunwell was in Heartland, Connecticut, standing on the doorstep of Bennett's Hotel when he heard a man say something that intrigued him. There goes Peter Rugg and his child. He looks wet and weary and further from Boston than ever. Dunwell spoke up. Peter Rugg? And who is Peter Rugg? He is a famous traveler, held in light esteem by all inholders, for he never stops to eat, drink, or sleep. I wonder why the government does not employ him to carry the mail. But, said Dunwell, does the man never stop anywhere? Does he never converse with anyone? I saw the same man more than three years since near Providence, and even then I heard a strange story about him. Sir, said the stranger, those who know the most respecting that man say the least. I have heard it asserted that heaven sometime sets a mark on a man, either for a judgment or a trial, under which Peter Rugg now labors, I cannot say. Therefore I am rather inclined to pity than to judge. He looks as though he never ate, drank, or slept. His child looks older than himself, and he looks like time broken off from eternity and is anxious to gain a resting place. As for his horse, 
He looks fatter and gayer and shows more animation than he did 20 years ago. The last time Rugg spoke to me inquired how far it was to Boston. I told him just 100 miles. Why, he said, how can you deceive me so? It is cruel to mislead a traveler. I've lost my way. Pray direct me to the nearest route to Boston. I repeated that it was 100 miles. How can you say so? I was told last night it was but 50, and I have traveled all night. I explained that he was going away from Boston, and of course he must turn back. Alas was his answer. It is all turned back. Boston shifts with the wind and plays all around the compass. One man tells me it is to the east, another to the west, and as for the guideposts, they all point the wrong way. He then gave the reins to the horse, and they disappeared within a moment. A few days afterwards, I met the man in Unity, New Hampshire, a little this side of Claremont, and he was going at the rate of 12 miles an hour. To everyone's surprise, a short time later, a dark, high-spirited horse came down the road towards Bennett's hotel. Realizing that it might be the chase, Jonathan Dunwell stepped into the street, making a feint to stop him. The driver reined his horse at once. Sir, said Dunwell, are you not Peter Rugg? My name is Peter Rugg, came the answer. I have unfortunately lost my way. I am wet and weary, and would take it kindly if you direct me to Boston. You live in Boston? And in what street? In Middle Street. How did you become wet? For it hasn't rained here today. It just rained a heavy shower up the Merrimack River. But should I take the old road or the Newburyport Turnpike? But this is not Newburyport. And the Merrimack River is a long distance away. This is Hartford, Connecticut. Rug wrung his hands and looked incredulous. Have the rivers, too, changed their course as the cities have changed places? Oh, that fatal oath. Peter Rugg then reined his horse, and a moment later was off, the horse's hind flanks rising like wings. Dunwell, having discovered a clue in Peter Rugg's history, that he had lived in Middle Street, Boston, decided that the next time he visited the Massachusetts capital, he would make further inquiries. A short time later he arrived in Boston, and went to the home of a Mrs. Croft in Middle Street. She told him that she had resided in Boston since 1803. Dunwell became excited when she was able to recall that Peter Rugg had actually visited her, probably in the summer of 1818. Possibly Peter Rugg had confused even himself and had doubled back to Boston that year. Mrs. Croft explained that in answer to a knock, she had opened the door to find Peter Rugg and his daughter while nearby in the street she noticed an old weather-beaten chase hitched to a black horse. I would like to speak to my wife, Catherine Rugg, Peter had said. I'm sorry, but Catherine Rugg has been dead for many years, came the answer, whereupon Peter Rugg became excited. How can you deceive me so? Do ask Catherine to step to the door. Sir, I assure you that Mrs. Rugg has not lived here these many years. There is no one here but myself, and I am Betsy Croft. Peter Rugg paused and looked up and down the street. Everything has changed, he remarked. The streets have changed, the town has changed, and what is strangest of all, Catherine Rugg has deserted her husband and child. Now, madam, will you please direct me to Boston? Why, exclaimed Mrs. Croft, this is Boston. Just a minute, answered Peter. I recollect now. I came over a bridge instead of a ferry. Pray, what bridge was it? It is the Charles River Bridge. Ah, that explains it. I perceive my mistake. There is a ferry between Boston and Charleston. There is no bridge. Therefore, I have made a mistake. Peter Rugg and his daughter returned to the chase, and a moment later drove away. That was the entire story, as Mrs. Croft could recall it. She now suggested that Dunwell talk with a Mr. James Felt, an antiquarian, felt during the interview expressed surprise when Dunwell said that he had seen Rugg and his small daughter not too long before. Why, my friend, I admitted felt, that Peter Rugg is now a living man, I will not deny. But that you have seen Peter Rugg and his child is impossible, if you mean a small child. For Jenny Rugg, if living must be at least, let me see, Boston Massacre, 1770, 
Jenny was about 10 years old. Why, sir, Jenny Rugg must now be at least 60 years old. Dunwell realized that he had as much information from Mr. Felt as he could get. He thanked the aged man and returned to his Marlboro hotel room, beginning to mull over what Mrs. Croft and James Felt had told him. He realized that if Peter Rugg had been traveling since the Boston Massacre, there wasn't any reason why he shouldn't keep on traveling to the end of time. Later, while discussing Peter Rugg at the hotel, he met a Boston resident whose family had long lived in the town. Peter Rugg, said the resident, once lived in Meadow Street. He was a man in comfortable circumstances, but unhappily, his temper was at times altogether ungovernable, and his language was terrible. And his fits of passion, if a door stood in his way, he would never do less than kick a panel through. Once Rugg was seen to bite a tenpenny nails and halves. In those days, everybody, both men and boys, wore wigs. Peter, at these moments of violent passion, would become so profane that his wig would rise up from his head. Some said it was on account of his terrible language. Others were of the opinion that it was caused by the expansion of his scalp, for violence swells the veins and expands the head. While these fits were on him, Rugg had no respect for heaven or earth. Except for this weakness, all agreed that Rugg was a good sort when his fits were over. One morning, late in the autumn, Rugg, in his own chase, with a large bay horse, took his daughter and proceeded to Concord. On his return, a violent storm caught up with him. At dark, he stopped and met Otomi, now Arlington, at the door of Mr. Cutter, a friend of his, who urged him because of threatening weather to tarry the night. On Rugg's declining to stop, Mr. Cutter became concerned and vehemently urged him to remain. Why, said Cutter, the storm is a terrible one and you should not go out again. The gale actually will overwhelm you and your daughter, who may perish. The night is very dark. You are in an open chase, and the tempest is getting worse. Let the storm increase, came the answer, and then Rugg swore a fearful oath. I will reach home tonight, in spite of the tempest blast, or I never will reach home again at all. Rugg whipped up his horse, and a moment later horse and chase, started to disappear down the road. Peter Rugg did not reach home that night, or the next, or the next. When his wife told the authorities that he was missing along with his daughter, they never could trace him after he left Manitomi. For years after, on every dark and stormy night, his wife would fancy that she heard the crack of a whip, the tread of a horse, and the rattling of a chase as it passed her home on Middle Street, Boston. The neighbors also heard the same noise. One special night, the neighbors decided to await the possible arrival of Peter Rugg and lighted their lanterns to be ready for him. Surely enough, he came down Middle Street, pulled by his great horse and with his daughter at his side, and their lanterns illuminated the scene very effectively. To their amazement, the horse pulled the carriage right by Peter Rugg's door, although every neighbor watching could see the poor man strained and struggled as he tried to slow up the horse, but it was all in vain. Wondering just where Rugg did stop, the neighbors visited every Boston Inn, public house, and stable, but it developed that Rugg stayed nowhere in Boston that night. The neighbors, quite shocked at the turn of events, never did try to watch again, and several of them considered what they had witnessed as no less than a delusion. Others shook their heads and said nothing. Rugg was then reported in Connecticut, after which New Hampshire became the scene of his appearances. Then there would be a talk of a man with a small child driving through Newport, followed by a storm. His last known appearance in the Boston area was on Charlestown Bridge. The toll gatherer asserted that on occasion, usually on the darkest and stormiest nights of all, a horse and wheel carriage with a terrible noise would pass over the bridge at midnight in utter contempt of toll rates. Finally, the toll collector decided to take action, and one rainy night stationed himself in the very center of the bridge. Soon he heard the noise of horse and chase coming from Charleston Square. Just as the horse and carriage passed him, he threw the three-legged stool he had brought right at the horse, but to his astonishment, the stool passed harmlessly through the animal and clattered to a stop some distance away. Peter Rugg, his horse, and his daughter were never seen again in Boston, or 
on any approach leading to the Massachusetts capital. Perhaps some day, when you are driving along a New England road, you may see Peter Rugg and his daughter, on the other hand. I hope not.